my big pleasure to introduce Patrick Brosman, who will continue uh, talk uh, of uh, Greg Perlstein uh, made yesterday about Heinz uh, Big Extension Land Bundle. Uh, um, uh, thanks for the invite. Um, so you did me aware of wherever you are. <laughs> uh, so this is a canonical extension of Haynes, uh, I guess by extension line bundle. Okay. So um, I want to start like just from like the geometric setting, uh, kind of to tell you what the by extension line bundle um, is supposed to capture ge like geometrically. Okay, so suppose like f from x to x is like a projective, or is a projective morphism of uh, smooth uh, complex, uh, maybe quasi-projective uh, varieties. Okay, and then suppose we have two cycles. So A uh, is in uh, ZJ of X and B is in ZK of X, so algebraic cycles. Okay, and where, where the dimension of X, so I'll write it as DX is dimension of X. Uh, uh, okay, minus, what I want is this, uh, minus J minus K is equal to uh, the dimension of S uh, minus one. And that works out to be uh, saying that uh, J plus K uh, is equal to DX minus DS plus one, um, which is the same thing as saying that, that would just that would, this would be the same thing, I'll write it, the generic fiber is X eta. So it's the same thing as saying J plus K is equal to the dimension of the generic fiber minus one, minus one, plus one. Okay, where eta, X8 is a generic fiber. Okay, then given these dimensions, you can get a line bundle on S by the following very simple thing. Um, uh, oh, actually, well, let me give before it. Yeah, well, yeah, so given these examples, you can get a line bundle. So given these dimensions. Restrictions, I don't know. Restriction. You get a line bundle. Okay, I'm going to call it a, like LAB. So L equals LAB. Um, uh, well, and it, just by by this, it's, uh, you just take F lower, sorry, you just take the proper push forward of the intersection of A and B. Okay, so. Um, uh, the the reason is that uh, well, well we have like the a j of x so the Chow group uh, well that tends to with a k of x that goes to a j plus k of x and then the push forward just by the the push forward maps because of these dimension restrictions it takes it to a one of x and that's equal to the uh, the Picard group. A one of S, and that's in uh, that's equal to the Picard group of S. Okay, so there's an example that Greg already brought up, but I'll, I'll, I'll just it's kind of an ex example that we always kind of start thinking about, and that's and it's what Hain what Hain was thinking about, and that's. Um, so I'll write it as a quasi-example because there's like a stack involved. Uh, okay, you just take uh, F from J3 to M3. You could do any, take any genus, but then, then you have to think about the numbers and it's, it's just easier to take this genus, just genus three. 
So the universal Jacobian over the moduli space of curves, over a moduli space of genus three curves. Okay, and then uh, you take A equal to, okay, they write, I got C for Teresa. So it's a Teresa cycle. It's C minus C negative. Uh, it's contained in the Jacobian of C. It's a Teresa cycle. Okay, so that, that gives me, uh, uh, I guess that's, that's really more proper to say that it's in A1 of JC. And then, um, and then just take B, uh, any translate, maybe generic translate, because we don't want them to really intersect of A. I mean, uh, since we're doing things in Chow groups, it almost doesn't matter if they intersect or not. Um, okay, and then so that they're both, so A and B are in uh, A1 of J, Three, and then uh, well, one plus if I did the things right, uh, I might have, I might have done it wrong because one plus one supposed to be dx eta minus one. If I do it to a minus one, I might have made a minus. I might have made a sign. Um, hmm, J plus k. Uh, no, they're in eight. <laughs> they're in A two. It's like co-dimension and dimension is like really. <laughs> they're in A two <laughs> because C is a curve, right? And it's in a threefold, so it's co-dimension two. <laughs> that was like that really could have been embarrassing. <laughs> and, uh, so two plus two is four, and that four, and then the, the dimension of the fiber is three, and then so it's three plus one. So the numbers work out. Okay, so then there there is like another thing. You can do to kind of move this away from uh, algebraic cycles just to kind of a little bit, and that is that instead of assuming that A and B are algebraic cycles, you could assume that they're actually like classes in Deline cohomology. Um, so you could assume instead that uh, A and B are Deline uh, uh, cohomology classes. Okay, and then you, know, you have a map. So there's a map. So there's a map from a k of x to the two k Deline x z k that cohomology group. So this is some. If you don't, that I'll say something about for the, you know, practically what this is. But this, it's the cohomology of a complex that starts with Z and then goes to O and then omega one and omega two. It's a kind of truncated part of the Duram complex. And there's a map, there's a, Deline has a cycle class map that goes from Chow groups to this, but it, it's, um, you know, it's not an isomorphism. Uh, and this is more topological and Hodge theoretic, and this is, more unknown. Uh, so, uh, but if A is in H2K Deline of X Z K and B is in H2J of X Z K with uh, uh, K plus J equal D eta plus one again, uh, then um, you still have F lower star of A cup B, that winds up being in H2 uh, of the base Z1 Deline. But okay, so in general, this, this thing is computable and this thing is not. But for 2, 1, this thing actually just is the Picard group of S. So um, you, again, you get a class in the Picard group. Okay. So there's um, there's another thing that you can do. Um, there's another there's another thing that you you can do, which is like kind of close closer. Uh, Uh, 
Oh, you mean for the cycle C? Oh, for yeah, cycle. yeah you should like what Greg did. Greg picked a point. Uh, I called it either P or Q. So yeah, you do have to. And I think when Greg just decided to to when Greg explained this, he picked one point. He wanted them to be disjoint at some at least generically disjoint. So he took one point for A to embed C in the Jacobian and another point for B. Okay, so uh, let's say A is primitive. If, um, if A restricted to X eta, uh, what well, X eta is the you know generic fiber uh, is trivial, J just in like the normal the I guess cohomology with rational coefficients. Okay, um, and then let's like let me make a diagram because I want to look at the place where uh, this map from X to S is smooth. So we have this X to S. That's the one we started out with. We have U. So this is like the 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 complement of the discriminant locus. So the the locus where the fibers are smooth. I mean the the locus where the map is smooth. Um, and then uh, let's write uh, let's write j two uh, k minus one over u for the uh, for the vibration of u by the the Griffiths intermediate Jacobians of the fibers uh, vibration of u by uh, the Griffiths intermediate Jacobians Um, so those are, uh, I can write down what those are. Uh, those are, so J2K minus 1, it's just of, of say, X eta. That's just H2K minus 1 of X eta C uh, mod. Okay, that's not going to work. Okay, now I have a, it's half. It's half the cohomology of this guy, uh, but I, I I do it like this. So so I put the uh, I guess to half the cohomology would really be f k plus one if I didn't put this shift, but then that confuses me, so I put the shift. Okay, and then h two k minus one of x eta z. Okay. Um, yeah, so th this is a complex vector space, even though I put the ZK here, because I, I mean F naught of the Hodge structure. And this is a, a lattice. So we're, what we're doing is we're, we're modding out a space uh, uh, of dimension equal to half the dimension of the 2K minus 1 cohomology by a lattice. OK, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, OK, so if A is in uh, this Deline guy, uh, um, which is pr primitive. Um, then restriction uh, to the fibers uh, gives a section uh, new A from U to this 2K minus 1 intermediate Jacobian, um, to, to this, uh, so a section of this map pi. Um, and uh, let me explain why that is, is, is like, when you see it in the link cohomology, it's pretty easy to see. The, the reason is that, uh, okay, there's an exact, there are two exact sequences. So H2K of X, ZK Deline. When you, so this guy is defined in terms of some complex that starts off with ZK. And because of that, it maps to 
the ha it actually winds up map mapping to the Hodge classes of dimension KK of X. Okay, and then on the kernel of that map is this J2K minus one intermediate Jacobian for X. Okay, and this, the doing cohomology is like functorial, so we can like map it to uh, X eta. And then this guy maps over here. And then, uh, then this guy, these are all, they're all actually functorial. So remember X, X eta is the fiber. So you see if I have a cycle A that's primitive, then it goes to zero here, so it has to go to zero here. So come somebody in there. So the image of the guy has to live in there. Okay, so. From that, um, so that means that from A and B, so if A and B are both primitive, A and B are both primitive, you get uh, a section, I'm going to call it like sigma, just to put them all together, that's going to be equal to like new A. Maybe I'll write it new A cross new B. And that'll go from U to the intermediate Jacobian for A. So it's like J 2K minus 1 cross over the base J 2J minus 1. OK? But because of the dimensions, because of the dimension restriction, these two are, are both dual. So uh, I'm going to write the one for K is just J, and the one for J, my, J is as uh, J dual. So this is just J cross J dual. OK, so then that gives us, so here J, J, J equals J 2 K minus 1. J dual is one to being J 2 J minus 1. OK, and because they're dual, there's like a Planck, there's a Planck array bundle over J cross J dual, we can pull it back and we get a line bundle. So um, if, if P denotes the Poincaré bundle, over J cross J dual, I guess that's over S, then uh, pulling back uh, P, to S by uh, sigma, it gives a bundle, which maybe I'll call, uh, what do I call it? Let me just call it F. I was going to call it B. But let's call it F, A, B. Look, the thing is, because the cycle's name is B, so if I call it B, uh, uh, that's bad. So this F, A, B, it's uh, a sigma upper star of the Poincaré bundle. OK, and this is the thing that, uh, that Hain, I mean, we, we got into, I don't know if Hain was the very first person to study it, but it's, I mean, we got into it because of Hain. So this is Hain's uh, by extension line bundle. Okay, so um, one thing to point out is that he, this guy starts life which Greg also pointed out, as an analytic line bundle. Uh, so no, this F, A, B is an analytic line bundle. On uh, U. And um, the, the reason why is, you know, it, you can't really naturally start life as an algebraic line bundle is that in general, J is not an algebraic variety. So in the case, I think Deline proved various things about the case when, uh, when you have a, when J is an abelian variety. And from that, you can actually, I believe you can get an algebraic structure on this. Um, 
Because essentially when J is an abelian variety, all these maps wind up being uh, algebraic. But uh, in general, he will, like, lives, he starts his life as an analytic thing. Okay, so, um, okay, so then here's our goals. The goal, and I maybe say we started on these goals in like 2005. Uh, okay, but, uh, but some of the goals in 2005, we didn't know that we had them. Um, so one is uh, to, to, to show that uh, uh, this LAB and FAB are uh, the same. Okay, and then uh, two, uh, show that FAB that F, which, which kind of would be, con uh, well, show that F, if, if you, once you know this, actually you know this, but we did this first. Show that FAB extends uh, to a line bundle, to, to S, to S bar, if S bar is a compactification, of S. And that it extends uniquely uh, as a Q-line bundle. Then there, there's a canonical choice of Q-line bundle extension. So, and that there's a canonical Q-line bundle extension. And then three, which, so one and two, well, no, actually two, we did several years ago. But the, the thing that was, we didn't do is um, prove a formula, <laughs> prove a formula. And maybe I'll say prove the obvious formula. That is, prove a formula for this extension, class of the extension. Okay, um, so it's really three that we, is like new. Um, the thing is, although uh, actually the form, we kind of knew the formula for a long time, we just didn't prove it. Um, so, uh, okay, what, 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 what? okay, so I want to, I have to, now, let me um, well, let me say one or one or two more things about like line bundles, which Greg said, but I was say them again. So there's a giant difference between like analytic line bundles and algebraic line bundles, and there are really two things to be aware of. So one is that uh, definitely not all analytic line bundles extend, as Greg pointed out. There are a lot of examples of line bundles on C two minus zero that don't extend to C two, and so those all those Line, analytic line bundles on C2 minus zero that don't extend, they can't be um, algebraic because the only algebraic line bundle on C2 is the trivial one. And th therefore the only uh, algebraic line bundle on C2 minus zero is a trivial one. Another thing to, wa to watch out for is that there is not a unique extension even if they do extend. So uh, an example of that is that if I have an open curve, just any curve that's not projective, then um, it's pretty easy to see from the exponential exact sequence that all the analytic line bundles are trivial. Just the analytic Picard group is zero. So, but you know, the algebraic Picard group is very much not zero. If you take a point out of a curve, I mean, it'll, it'll basically be the Picard group of the curve. So if you take two points, it's different. But, but anyway, it's very big, no matter how many points you take out of the curve, finite number of points. Uh, so, um, so there. Are, so it's it's not just showing that something is algebraic that's important. It's showing which structure is algebraic. So, for example, any analytic line bundle on um, a curve minus a point has an algebraic structure because they're all trivial. But like the parametrizing the extensions of them is like kind of important. Okay. I mean, uh, 
Uh, no, that, okay, there, there are people that have done things about this. <laughs> I, yes, Schiff, Schiffman has some things about this. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, but I, so, so it's important to say what kind of extension we want. Uh, Greg basically said it, but uh, maybe say something more about this. Um, and anyway, it's it's a, a matter of how we work with uh, uh, how we work with um, normal functions, the so maps into uh, Griffiths intermediate Jacobians. Okay, so uh, so I just remind you something. Also, Greg was talking about. So we always fix so H, suppose H is a weight minus one. Uh, hard structure. So the reason, every since you can do Tate twists, any odd weight thing can be shifted to weight minus one, and it's just way easier to always think of one weight. So that's why, why it's minus one and not one. It's not that important, but, but, um, okay. So Carlson proved this theorem, um, and it's. So actually, Carlson's theorem is more general, and I'm, I'm even going to use the more general thing. But Carlson proved that the Griffiths intermediate Jacobian is, uh, as a group, it's x1 in the category of mixed hard structures of z by h. So actually, Carlson considered any mixed hard structure, the weights had to be, I think, less than or equal to minus 1 if for this picture. Um, OK, you can say the same. Can say the same uh, for variations. Okay. Um, so uh, if, um, if 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 we have this picture. Uh, okay. So we have x to s, and then u contained in here, and then x u. Okay. And then we have this j. J over U, J two K minus one. Okay. Um, then um, the, the normal functions, the sections, the sec. Let me kind of the sections of J to U, uh, which um, satisfy Griffith's transversality. Let me leave it vague. Which satisfy Griffith's transversality. Are called normal functions. And the group of them is also an X group. And the group of these. Is okay. So I, I like this Saito notation. He writes it like this: N F H, uh, and it it just winds up being the X one in the category of variations of mixed hot structure of Z by H. Okay. Um, now what Saito also? Oh yeah. Well, let me put it. So so actually, we don't really need these cycles. We just need the sections of, uh, we just need the normal functions to define this line bundle. So let me kind of, let me, let me write that down. So given, so nu and omega in nf uh, uh, cross nf u, okay, h v. So h v, this guy is, uh, this the guy's the one that makes a dual uh, intermediate Jacobian. So it's H star, but then I always want to have things in weight minus one, so it fits it by minus one. H star makes it takes it from minus one to one, and then the twist by one, not by minus one, puts it back. Okay. So if we have new and W in that, then uh, we get this line bundle. F 
which I'll just call f of new omega because it's really going to be the same idea. It's going to be uh, sigma upper star of p, where sigma is equal to just new omega, and that goes uh, from u to just j cross j. So this is the same thing, it's just I don't need the cycles or even the classes in Deline cohomology anymore. Just use the normal function. Okay, now, um, okay, Saito noticed um, that, uh, like, there's a, an, an extra condition that comes from geometry, which also Greg also already brought up. And that is um, the uh, condition of admissibility. So admissibility is a condition on variations of Hodge structure, or mixed Hodge structure. It's automatic for variations of Hodge structure, and it follows from Schmidt's theorems. But uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not automatic for uh, uh, variations of mixed hot structure, and the ones, it, it, it's basically a tameness condition. I mean, it, it causes things not to behave like the exponential function, but rather to be kind of well-behaved. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, uh, so, the, so we, um, so, Normal functions uh, coming from geometry, they lie in the subgroup. So NF, okay, the, uh, Saito also writes like this UH add, add is for admissible, and that's just X1. Of a, it happens to be x1 of a smaller subcategory. So x1 variates the mixed Hodge structure, but then add ch. OK. Um, OK, so um, what we want what we want to do is so our, our real goal, so goal now is um, to compute. Uh, this L V nu, or F V nu, uh, F nu, uh, sorry, F nu omega, uh, in the case nu omega are admissible. Admissible means in here. Okay, as well as this extension to S, as well as this extension. To, well, the compactification of U, so to, to S. Okay. Um, okay, now this is. Okay, so, to, uh, so I want to explain what that extension is. And uh, in order to explain it, I have to, uh, I want to go back to. Uh, Something also Greg said was Greg said what the sections of this are over U, so and that's really something that's like Cain uh, pointed out. So we have so the the sections, the non-vanishing sections of this line bundle L nu omega. Or F, I keep calling it L F nu omega. themselves have a Hodge theoretic interpretation. Theoretic interpretation. Okay, and what, what, what are they? It's just, uh, so F mu omega of u, so the, the non-vanishing guys. So I'll, I'll write it star for the non-vanishing ones. So it's the set of variations of mixed Hodge structure, MHS, 
um, on you, uh, so let's call them V on you, uh, together with isomorphisms Um, okay, so uh, V mod W minus 2. The, the variations, let me draw the picture. I think Greg might have drawn this. You have Z, H, Z of 1. That's going to be the graded pieces. The top, you want to make the top parts of V be like nu, and the bottom parts be omega. Because nu is an extension of Z by H. Oh, I forgot to say something. Well, I forgot to say. Oh, yeah, I forgot to say something. H winds up being ex extensions of, uh, omega winds up being extensions of H by Z1. Okay, so I, I have to, uh, there's something I think Greg said, but I forgot to say. But anyway, so V mod W minus 2, that's equal to nu. And W minus 1 of V, that's equal to omega. And I have to say something. So uh, it turns out that NF of U HV, that, by definition, I mean, by Saito's formula, that's x1, or by Carlson's formula, it's x1 of z by hv. But because of this properties of duality, it winds up also being x1 of h by z1. OK, and then what's going on here? So why is this, uh, why, why do, why do these variations give you the non-vanishing sections of a line bundle? Well, as Greg pointed out, you kind of fix this extension from Z to H, and you fix this extension from H to Z1. So then by some homological algebra thing, which I might split, uh, skip, the rest of it winds up being extensions of Z by Z of 1. But extensions of Z by Z of 1 in the category of mixed Hodge structure is equal to O star, uh, is equal to C star. That's kind of an easy cop, it's, it follows directly from Carlson's formula, actually. So um, what you're doing when you leave that extension of Z by Z01 open is you're, you're kind of giving yourself an O star towards her. Um, in fact, yeah, let me, I, I can actually write the, this, I can write this in a way that makes it, there's an exact sequence to write that makes it obviously clear. So let me write new, that's gonna be zero to H to some guy, I'll just call it new to Z to zero, and omega, that's gonna be zero to Z one, to omega to H to zero, these are the two normal functions. Okay, and what I just do is I, I take x of z, I basically hom z into this, I hom z into omega. And what I wind up with is like, I get a zero that goes to x1 of uh, z by z of one in the category of variations of mixed Hodge structure. Okay, so let's say I do admissible. Then x1 of, uh, Z by omega, then x to one of Z by H. And see, uh, nu sits in here, okay? And this guy, if I do admissible variations, it winds up being O U star, but meromorphic. So it turns out that the admissible variations, they all wind up, if I didn't put admissible there, the X would just be all analytic function, non-matching analytic functions on U. But if I put admissible there, it like creates some, makes, forces them to be meromorphic along the boundary. Okay, and then, <clears throat> so what is a torsor? Let's just call this like, I don't know, pi or P. It's just P inverse of U. So if you think about it, the set of all these Vs are just the people in here that map down to U. That's what it winds up being. And then that's a torso under this because I don't I don't know if it's called a zero or one, but this this group injects into there. Okay. Okay. Well, actually, okay, I, I lie a little bit because just knowing this, you don't actually know that you have a torso. 
you know that you have what's called a pseudo torsor. A pseudo torsor is a torsor, except this one might be empty. Could be empty, right? There's nothing that says this could be empty. What well, wouldn't be? Wouldn't be empty. There might not be anything that hits this, right? So uh, there might. I mean, the, not, yeah, there might not be. This guy might not be in the image, okay? But then we have a theorem um, of me and Greg from. I don't know, maybe it was around 2018 that it appeared. Um, that the above pseudo torsor uh, for OU star meromorphic is actually a torsor. Okay, so what does that really mean? That means that there's like an open covering of S where the on each set in the open covering, this thing is non-empty. You know, okay. Uh, so more, so consequently, uh, f of nu omega uh, extends to a meromorphic. It has a meromorphic structure. Okay, and extends to a line bundle on f. On S. Okay, the only thing is it wouldn't extend in a unique way because if you have the boundary divisor, you could add whatever you want of whatever multiples of whatever components of the boundary divisor and still be an extension. So, moreover, it comes, so moreover, okay, well maybe I'll, I'll leave this out of the theorem and I'll, and I'll say something else. So, this this thing f nu omega it also comes with a metric, so f nu omega comes with a metric that we call that really that Hain called the height I think Hain called it the height metric, and it's I mean the metric is really I think what got Hain thinking about it, and. Uh, uh, Greg actually said something about the metric. The, to get the metric, you essentially just tensor everything with R. If you tensor with R, this thing, uh, so x1 of R by R of 1, that's just R. Okay, that, not, uh, uh, we do it at every point. So at every point, that's just R. And then, um, yeah, maybe, I won't, maybe I won't say. But the, the point is, I mean, Greg actually described it. I, I have to switch from variations of mixed odd structure to individual mixed odd structures to say what the metric is. But if I tensor with R at a point, x1 of R by R1 is just R. Uh, and then x1 of R by H is just zero, because uh, there is no extensions between real Hodge structures of adjacent weights. So these two become isomorphic at a point. So that means that for every guy in here, you have a canonical way of getting a real number at a point, and that puts a metric on it. Okay, so, so then, so, so, uh, so consequently, okay, um, so let, let, me, let me put myself into a situation. So uh, suppose, let's suppose S is projective. I, uh, I have this, now I forget about x, but I still have s contained in u. And uh, u is a complement of a cross, normal crossing divisor. Uh, it's maybe a strict normal crossing divisor. Uh, let's call the d divisor d. So then we can like divide out by, we can, we, so, so consequently, There is an extension, a canonical extension, uh, of f nu omega to s, okay, as a q-line bundle. And I'll explain why it's q, uh, at least try to explain why it's q. As a q-line bundle with the property
that um, uh, the, uh, for any point in the smooth locus of the divisor, there's a section whose height is bounded, a non vanishing section whose height is bounded. Uh, so for any P in the smooth locus of the normal crossing divisor, so the part where they're not intersecting each other, there's a, a non vanishing section. with bounded height. OK, and I have to say why Q. I mean, why Q? So the, the point is that the heights, um, we know that the, what the asymptotics of the heights are. And they basically look like some rational, if you take the log of things, it looks like some rational number times log of a parameter. So uh, we don't have to deal with like any real number times log of the parameter, so we can kill the denominator, but we really might have a denominator. And that's why we need this Q line bundle, okay? And uh, let me give it a name. So uh, it's canonical to S as a Q line, but let's call this guy F bar of nu omega. Okay, and what I want to tell you is a formula for what this guy is. Um, So um, there's another theorem that I should tell you before. Uh, so I want a formula. Formula for this f bar nu omega. So like a cohomological formula is what I want. Um, and so maybe I'll just okay. So. Variations of mixed Hodge structure, the admissible guys. I'm going to put it on an S. And it's a U. So they sit inside Saito's, uh, um, let me just write this, contained in Saito's category of mixed Hodge modules on U. Okay. So, and the variations of mixed Hodge structure, they behave like local systems. So they're kind of really good for X1. But for things like involving X2 and so forth, they're not really very good because um, they're, they're forced to be in, like, they can't degenerate anywhere but on that guy U. Okay, so uh, on the other hand, Saito has a, 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 there are two isomorphisms that are due to Saito. So one is he has a cycle class map. He has a way of getting from AK of X to the extensions in the category of mixed Hodge modules on X, so 2K of Q, K. So mixed Hodge modules, they always, you have to, always have to tensor with Q. And this is an isomorphism when K, which was an isomorphism with when K equals one. Okay, for an X smooth, X smooth. Okay, so what cohomological formula we want, and the reason we want it is we want it to have a cohomological formula that looks like the cup product, which is what we first started out with. So we want a cohomological formula that takes place in here when k equals one. Okay, so then there's um, maybe I tell, let me tell you the formula. Um, yeah, so there's a theorem of me and Greg and uh, Hao Fang and Zhao Huni that uh, um, that goes like this. So suppose uh, zero goes to H, goes to nu, goes to C. So zero is an admissible variation. Oh, how many minutes does that mean I have? More. Okay, because I'm almost done. I'm, I'm, uh, admissible variation on you. On you. Then um, I can apply the, uh, the and let's say J, then the IC sheaves. So, so we get an extension. So zero to IC of H, to IC of nu, to IC of H. So the IC of Z is just Z. Uh, Shifted by shifted by D. 
I mentioned in beta. Okay, let me tell you what's going on here. So H is a variation on U. IC takes it to something on S. Uh, this would be DS maybe. Okay, and but it, since H might degenerate, the IC sheaf has to take it to something that really is a mixed Hodge module. It doesn't. It's not smooth. Okay, now usually this IC functor is not an exact functor. It's what they call. Cat has a word for it. It preserves injection and pres preserves surjection, but it's not an IC. Uh, um, it's not an exact functor. But when H is weight minus one, which I'm assuming. Uh, there's kind of no room for it not to be exact. There's like a weight argument. That means there's no room not to be exact. So you get from a variation, uh, from a normal function nu, you get an extension, and I should write q here. You get an extension in, cate in the category of mixed Hodge modules of q by ic of h. Okay, and then here's the formula, which is like the obvious formula. So this is the, the new theorem. Okay, so suppose uh, we have this new. Okay, that's given. I'll, I'll rewrite. Maybe I'll rewrite it. Zero to h to the new to z zero and omega is zero c one to omega to h to zero. Then. Um, F new omega bar in uh, pick S is the class corresponding to the Yoneda cup product. Okay, so of these two guys, but in mixed Hodge modules. So you, you take um, IC of omega uh, and you compose that with IC of new, right? So I see omega, that guy's in uh, X in the category of mixed Hodge modules of uh, Q by I C of H. And this guy is in the category of mixed Hodge modules, this is X1, in the category of mixed Hodge modules of I C of H by Q of one. So it lands, this whole cup product lands in X2 of uh, Q by Q1, which is the Picard group tensor Q. And that, that's the theorem. Uh, and that, oh, that, I mean, probably out of time. The real, maybe I said what, <laughs> like the real, I mean, this theorem, it might look kind of scary, but at the same time, for, there are a couple of nice factors. So one is it, it, this Yoneda extension, this Yoneda product, it behaves well with respect to the cup products in uh, this, these cohomology groups. Uh, the other thing that's nice is that the formula, okay, it, it kind of looks scary when you have the IC thing, but on the smooth locus in cohomology, the formula is kind of a, a, like a well-known formula that you're just taking the cup product of the classes in H1. So um, it, it kind of, uh, yeah, so it generalizes that. Um, yeah, that uh, I guess that's it, that's all. Yeah, that's all I have, that's really all I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, like, like the the way the you mean this this one element of x one the this guy or the the yeah, normal function? Yeah. 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 To M3, uh, M3 bar, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, uh, okay, Hayne wrote a paper about what that extension is, uh, and uh, we might have, and knowing that extension, by the way, is part of the reason that he got into it. Um, so, um, like the, so he knows what it is explicitly in terms of like the, um, Greg, in terms of like lambda and the boundary divisors, or in terms, you know, what is it? 
He knows what it is explicitly, the line bundle, right? Part of the reason that he wanted to study it and the, where it got us into it is that um, he wanted to have a met, he wanted the, this height metric. He wanted to show that that height metric had, let's say, like favorable uh, um, curvature properties. Basically, uh, that it should be pluri subharmonic on the interior. And then he noticed that it has, uh, that the asymptotics, the asymptotics are in very good control on the locus of compact curve, curves of compact type. So curves where the Jacobian is actually a, a abelian variety. But on the uh, intersection of del delta naught is the locus of uh, just nodal G minus one curve. On, on the intersection of that with itself, the asymptotics of the metric don't look good. <laughs> And uh, so, so then that's actually what got it. studying the asymptotics of the metric along uh, the intersection of delta naught with itself is what got us into the, this whole thing. So that, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the one, the what Greg is saying is that the, I mean, there are certain cases where you could use this because you get a metrized line bundle. So in cases where the Picard group is small, Z, you could try to like compare it to, or where you just know that the line bundle you have is a multiple of something else with the metric. You can try to compare the two metrics and have a function. So in the end, uh, actually, Hain was doing that. I mean, he was getting up. He was, wanted to get a function on M three, and to just I think he wanted to explicitly describe that function and the asymptotics of that function. So I don't know if these comments answer your question, <laughs> but but that, yeah, that I mean, we also studied the as as Greg pointed out, we wrote down a pairing on the first intersection cohomology of H at a point that tells you um, the deviation of the metric from extending. Um, but um, yeah, that. Um, well, more questions? OK, if not, let's thank uh, Patrick again. Uh, and we resume at 1.30 after the lunch.